Uh, if you have any questions of any of the presenters at any time, I would encourage you to submit those questions in the chat box. You don't have to wait until the presentation ends. Uh, we will be taking uh, questions from, from Susie right after she fin finishes uh, her presentation because she has some obligations that she needs to take care of. Uh, but with uh, Jim and Dale, we're going to probably wait until the end of the webcast to address those questions. But like I said, you can ask them at any, any time and we will try and address them. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Susie. Susie is with the Environmental Defense Fund and she's going to be covering market-based conservation opportunities for manure management. Susie? Thank you. And um, Mark, one technical thing, the buttons to click forward seem to have disappeared from my screen. I may need your help in advancing the presentation. Is that okay? That is fine. I will, I will do it if they don't reappear for you. Okay, thank you. Um, so I just, uh, my name again, I'm Susie Friedman. I'm an Agriculture Projects Manager at the Center for Conservation Incentives at Environmental Defense Fund. Oh, perfect, thanks. Um, and we focus on a lot of collaborative and market-based opportunities, so I was really glad to get the opportunity to talk about this today. And I'm really going to give a broad overview of some of the market-based opportunities uh, for agriculture and for manure management in particular. One big question is why look to the marketplace? I think one of the big reasons is as important as federal and state cost share and other assistance programs are, there just never will be enough public money to get the job done. Um, also, in many cases, there are greater opportunities for innovative approaches and flexibility through marketplace opportunities, and in some cases, greater sustainability over time. Um, also, greater potential for ongoing rewards. So broadly, uh, the marketplace opportunities, I think, can be referred to as payments for ecosystem services. And these can bridge the gap between what providers, in this case farmers, can provide in terms of environmental benefits and those that use them, namely the public. So uh, getting out of the marketplace a reward for farmers that produce uh, clean water, clean air, climate benefits, uh, landscape benefits, and a whole variety of things beyond the food and fiber that they produce. <clears throat> So how do you leverage the marketplace? Well, I think uh, there are four broad categories of marketplace opportunities. One being the publicly funded arena, um, the green payments programs, and direct private payments for ecosystem services, uh, marketing based on environmental standards and certification, and then environmental credit markets. And I'm just going to touch briefly on each of these. <coughs> So green payments are basically the publicly funded part of the marketplace in which the government defines and purchases those benefits. A really great example of this is the New York City watershed program that I think Dale is going to be speaking more about in which, in which farmers are paid um, and rewarded for protecting drinking water that the city of New York relies upon. Um, so within this program, the city took a long, hard look at did, did it want to, uh, is it going to need to upgrade its uh, drinking water program and uh, um, uh, wastewater treatment plants or look to reward those who are managing the lands that uh, affect its drinking water. And they've put together a really exciting program that I think has been very successful. Another big one is USDA's Conservation Security Program, which has a goal to reward farmers uh, for their performance in terms of the environment. Um, there are a lot of other programs as well, um, but I think this is one that is taking an innovative step in terms of trying to reward based on performance. So moving to direct private payment for ecosystem services, this is where the private sector defines and purchases the benefits. And there are a lot of opportunities in this arena because there are many businesses that depend on water quality and other benefits for their businesses, whether they're uh, recreational businesses, water users, suppliers, developers. One exciting example of this is the uh, concept of conservation communities in which uh, developers of communities or housing developments 
really take into consideration the landscape and uh, water quality benefits and other benefits that can be provided um, by land users and in this case agriculture. And one good example of this is the Prairie Crossing community in Illinois. In the mid-1980s, a group of neighbors who wanted to preserve open space and the agricultural land purchased the land that is now uh, called Prairie Crossing, and it's on 677 acres in Illinois. And they formed a company with a primary goal of creating responsible development and built a total of 359 single-family homes and 36 condominiums instead of the 2,400 homes that had been planned by another developer. And agriculture provides a real anchor for this community. And in fact, it's centered around an organic farm that sells produce to the community. Um, in this, most cases, a lot of other countries are further ahead in using direct private payment services, but I think this is starting to take hold more here as well. Next, environmental standards and certification. And this is where uh, farmers can tap directly into consumers based on environmental performance. And there are a lot of different forms that this can take, whether it's premium pricing and niche marketing, preferred purchasing, or market share guarantee. There are a number of different initiatives that are underway right now to leverage the marketplace in this way for environmental, uh, environmental performance through the creation of standards based on production and management. A couple examples are the Lodi Woodbridge wine, um, which is in California, healthy grown potatoes in Wisconsin, and a new dairy initiative in the Chesapeake Bay that's seeking to develop standards and a certification based on environmental performance. Um, just a little bit about the um, Lodi Woodbridge uh, wine and healthy grown initiative. Uh, the Lodi rules for sustainable wine growing are California's first sustainable wine growing standards. And they've been peer reviewed by scientists, academics, and environmentalists, and are being implemented on a region-wide basis. Participating growers can get their vineyards certified as producing sustainably grown wine grapes, and many are now getting a premium for, uh, for their wine based on that environmental performance. Similarly, Healthy Grown Potatoes uh, uh, is an initiative that looks in particular at pesticide use. and um, brought a number of different farmers and other partners together to look at reducing that footprint and selling their potatoes based on that uh, improved environmental performance. And then environmental credit markets, and I know Jim is going to talk more about this in particular for carbon, um, but there are a variety of different environmental credit markets that are either out there or uh, starting to be developed. Carbon credits, I think, are the best known, although still a, um, a market that has not been tapped extensively for agriculture, although I think it's going to be done so more and more. Water quality trading is newer, but starting to take hold in a number of different states, including uh, programs in Oregon, Ohio, and Pennsylvania um, that have programs up and running, and a number of other states that are just getting them developed. Um, in terms of uh, carbon, a farmer anywhere can tap into the, the voluntary carbon market um, by the Chicago Climate Exchange through an array of aggregators, um, although there are many, including Environmental Defense Fund, that are looking to a national cap and trade program that we hope will be in place within the next few years through the Warner-Lieberman legislation that will significantly increase the price that farmers can get for their climate benefits um, and create a uh, drive prices in that direction. Um, in terms of water quality trading, it's a bit more uh, state by state or watershed by watershed. Uh, the programs are created at the state or watershed level and so um, have their own and define who is eligible and what can be traded. Um, in Oregon, it's called the Clean Water Services Watershed Program. Pennsylvania has a statewide nutrient trading program. And there's also a program developed in the, um, by the Miami uh, Conservation District in Ohio. The Clean Water Services Watershed Program in Oregon involves wastewater plants paying farmers upstream to plant buffers to reduce temperature. Uh, the program in the Great Miami River in Ohio has wastewater plants paying farmers for nitrogen and phosphorus reductions from farmland. Um, and in Pennsylvania, uh, the program was developed by the Department of Environmental Protection and it creates a nutrient trading program that 
uh, really look to farmers to generate reductions. Uh, in one of the uh, in one trade, the Exxon Corporation paid the, paid the project cost for a forested buffer and conservation easement with a 25-year life and gained credits for an annual nutrient sediment and carbon credits. Um, in terms of the payments and what farmers can get, um, it ranges across the board. Uh, carbon right now selling for about $5.80 a ton. But if we move to a regulated market, that will probably go up um, uh, much higher. For instance, in the EU, it's selling for, I believe, about $35 a ton. And again, with nutrient trading, it's state by state. One thing that we think is really important to enable farmers to really tap into these markets are assessment tools. And these are lacking in a lot of arenas. Uh, farmers are really going to need ways that they can very cost-effectively measure their performance reliably, because uh, the market's not really going to want to buy something it can't measure and assess. So I think this is one arena that is really critical for research development and demonstration uh, to better enable farmers to really tap into the marketplace and look to the marketplace to reward them and help incentivize environmental performance. I already covered a lot of uh, issues on how the game is played. Um, it, again, depends and, and ranges widely for carbon, the Chicago Climate Exchange, water quality very site specific. In terms of green payments, um, every state and federal program is a bit different. You really need to get the information from the specific agency. And environmental certification and marketing uh, depends on the purchaser, the retailer, or what a farmer is looking to do if they are able to market directly to consumers. So that's really a, a very quick, uh, broad run through the variety of opportunities. And I know that Dale and Jim are going to get into some more detail on some specific topics. Thank you, Susie. Uh, like I said earlier, Susie is going to be running, so if anybody uh, has any questions for her real quick, uh, 